again and welcome back to another edition of the Wiccan Conservative. Today I wanted to sidestep the mainstream media news cycle, everything that's going on in Afghanistan, all the things that are going on with the new coronavirus restrictions, and refocus everybody's attention back to January 6th. And the reason that I want to do this is simply because I don't believe that people really know what's going on with these people who are stuck in limbo um, with all of these capital breach cases. So I did a little bit of digging and um, I hope that you guys have your breakfast down um, or lunch rather at this time because... This is quite disgusting. Um, I know that we've heard a lot about these cases. Uh, The mainstream media would have you believe that a majority of the people have pled guilty, um, that there's an overwhelming amount of people that are turning each other in. They're um, rolling over. They're starting to... um, confess their crimes. They're starting to um, make false claims that, you know, they felt coerced or brainwashed or, um, you know, kind of bullied into the January 6th incident. But when you go through these cases, and please do bear with me because there are a lot of cases But when you go through these cases and you look at the charges and then you read the actual arrest reports, it's very, very, very disturbing how low the threshold is to be considered a domestic terrorist, to be considered a convicted or I'm sorry, a um, alleged felon. It's very scary to see these charges, and then how they actually got to this point. Because a lot of these people weren't arrested on January 6th. And I'm going to prove to you how disgusting this contact tracing, this um, social media monitoring, the big tech being in bed with government really is. And I know that we talk about it all the time. Right now, I'm, I'm very aware that the DHS has submitted a memo stating that anybody that goes against the um, coronavirus restrictions, anybody that talks about the U.S. Capitol breach in, in a positive manner, somebody that's not bashing it, is going to be targeted and is going to um, more than likely end up on an FBI watch list. I'm very very aware of that. And I'm willing to take that chance, regardless of how small or how large my platform is, to bring this information to you. Because I've heard plenty of conservatives talking about it. I've heard a lot of people brushing across the main points and the main ideas. But I haven't seen anybody actually go into an in-depth discussion about what actually happened to the people on January 6th. And I'm going to bring to you some cases that are borderline. And I'm also going to bring to you some cases that actually do have some merit to them. Um, If you go back to my video after January uh, 6th, um, after the certification of the votes, I uh, expressed my opinion very plainly as to how I felt about the Capitol breach. With that being said, I do believe criminals need to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. But I don't understand how you can be arrested for uh, parading, demonstrating, or protesting on a public Capitol building during a sanctioned meeting event, um, you know, this was done during the certification of the votes hearing. Um, So here's the big thing. 
when you have BLM out in their communities and destroying the livelihood of the communities that they claim to represent, I felt that it was very disruptive to their cause. I felt that it was something that made their point less valid because they weren't helping their communities. They were out destroying things and it did them no justice to behave that way. The same thing applies at the Capitol building. You know, I, I don't believe that you should go in there tearing things up. I don't believe in the destruction of property. I don't believe in unabashedly um, attacking an officer or a counter protester or anything to that effect. But I personally watched three separate live streams, including but not limited to C-SPAN's own live stream. And based on what I saw during the event, it was a majorly peaceful protest to the process. The things that escalated into violence, um, some instances were provoked, and in other instances, they don't appear to be provoked. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to show you some of this information. On the screen behind me, you're going to see the uh, United States Attorney's Office, District of Columbia. This is coming from justice.gov. And this is an entire list of the capital breach cases. So as you'll see, below is a list of the defendants charged in the federal court in the District of Columbia related to crimes committed at the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday, January 6, 2020. Every case is being prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. Following arrests or surrender, defendants must appear before District Court Magistrate Judge where the arrest takes place in accordance with the federal rules of criminal procedure. <coughs> Excuse me. And so as you go down the list here, first things first, you're going to notice that um, a lot of these people weren't arrested at the Capitol. So you'll see um, the location of the arrest over here in the one, two, three, four, fifth column, and then the case status and the last entry updated list in the last column. So it really depends on where these people are as to when these cases were last updated. And I want to tie this back into um, the Afghanistan thing at the end of this video as well, because I also happen to notice something interesting about when these people go back to court. But I digress for now. So uh, first here, you know, it's going by alphabetical order. So you have Adams, Jared Hunter, and a laundry list of charges. Entering and remaining in a restricted building, disorderly and disruptive conduct in a restricted building, violent entry and disorderly conduct at a Capitol building, parading, demonstrating, or picketing in a Capitol building. If we have the right to redress our government for our grievances, um, I would like to know where you're supposed to parade, demonstrate, or picket when you're redressing a specific grievance. So the specific grievance was with the Congress certifying what the people believe to be illegal votes and a, um, a shady election process. And they had begged at their state level to not have these votes sent up to D.C. in the first place. And then you turn around, send them up there, and wonder why people showed up to protest at the Capitol building. And now they're charged. They're charged with parading, demonstrating, or picketing in a Capitol building and entering or remaining a restricted building or grounds. So does the Capitol belong to the people or does it belong to the government? You see, I thought our tax dollars paid for that building and I thought that our representatives worked in that building. So if we, the people, have a problem with the procedures that are happening inside the building, why wouldn't we be there? Why wouldn't we be entitled to be there? Another thing that I want you guys to kind of take a look at here 
is um, as we go down this list, you'll see that a lot of these are the like carbon copy claims, knowingly uh, entering and remaining in a restricted building uh, without lawful authority, violent entry, disorderly conduct on capital grounds, obstruction of a pro uh, official proceeding. And then in this column over here, <laughs> excuse me, you will see the dates of, of the arrests and then what's happening when it comes to the pleas and when they will see the inside of a courtroom. And so a lot of these people ended up getting out of the Capitol on January 6th. And then they were, um, uh, I guess, apprehended in different states and different counties through different methods. So let's keep going down here. This guy, he was arrested. Uh, Tommy uh, Allen was arrested uh, January 22nd in Granite Bay, California. Chase Allen wasn't arrested until June 30th. Um, and he was arrested in Massachusetts. Uh, this guy, he was arrested in, or on January 29th. Uh, these people have, have, I, I, I just, I, I, I can't wrap my brain around it. How is it that these people, they remained, they were picketing, they were demonstrating, they were unauthorized in, in, in the Capitol. Um, you have all this information pertaining to these people but you weren't able to apprehend these suspects at the time. So that was the first thing that really stuck out to me is how many people were actually arrested on January 6th at the Capitol building. And I went to see if that was actually something that I could look up because obviously this is just a laundry list of the cases. Here, let me scroll down to the end here. I know I'm going to go really, really fast just so that you can see how long this list is. I'm not trying to cheat you guys out of any information. If you have to slow it down, slow it down. Links to this um, website will be in the description box. So let's just go ahead down here. Look at this. Look at this. This is insane. There, there are a bunch, bunch of people. Most of the defendants on this list... Um, remain on personal recognizance bond, which is a, an ROR, released on your own recognizance, meaning it's probably your first offense, you don't have a criminal background, and the courts trust you to get out, um, out of jail and then return for your regularly scheduled hearings. Um, usually that, that type of bond is only reserved for first offense. And it's interesting because, as you can see, as we're going down here, there's a lot of personal recognizance um, bails. And a lot of people on this list are pleading not guilty to all these arrests. Now, I know that you guys aren't catching a whole lot of the uh, status hearings or the, the conference dates. But just real quick, let's, let's take a look. 9, 928. This is at 10-5. Um, this one is on 9-21. This one's for 8-19. So this is in a couple days. This person's supposed to go back 9-17. This person's 9-27. Um, they all kind of have around about the same court date. And I think it's really interesting that they've rounded all these people up and set all these hearings for September, considering everything that's going on in Afghanistan right now and the remarks that President Biden made against the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So if the DHS went ahead and released a memo kind of stating what they were looking for um, in regards to domestic terrorism and those catch phrases, those red flags, those, those little things that you should be looking for happen to be things that coincide with what 
these people are being charged with. Um, entering and remaining in a restricted building, entering and remaining certain rooms in the Capitol building, disorderly conduct, uh, forcible assault, resisting arrest, um, obstruction of law enforcement. Um, you know, these are the types of things that were released on the DHS uh, memo, the Department of Homeland Security memo. And magically, you've got all these conferences set up for right around the time that you're claiming that we are at the highest risk for a domestic terrorist or a foreign terrorist attack. I know I was supposed to say that till the end of the video, but honestly, I just, it, it struck me funny because obviously I've been looking at this for a couple days, which is why I, ha I haven't seen you guys. I've been sick to my stomach over this. Um, to me, it's just absolutely disgusting that these people are being charged with protesting their government. And quite literally, that's that's what they're being being charged with. Um, so. This isn't the end of it. This this is just a quarter. Let's scroll all the way down here to, to, to the Z's, because I promised you the whole list. And we're going to get down to the bottom no matter how long it takes me to get there. Because you have to understand how many people are being charged. And what they're being charged with is just a repeat. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. So let's go all the way down to uh, Joseph's lab. And um, I actually have his case pulled up, I believe, somewhere in my tabs here. But... That's how many people are being charged. It's it's a laundry list. I highly encourage you, go on to justice.gov, look up the capital breach cases, go in and read these complaints. But I digress. When you click at the top of the page, it has an FBI most wanted list. And I thought this was pretty interesting. I just happened to click on it before I started recording here because I want to know what's going on. And I think it's kind of funny that not only, <laughs> not only are you um, using this, this vague language and using these regurgitated charges and charging American citizens for redressing their grievances with their government in the proper place at the proper time, but you're also asking people to turn other people in it. And I know you can't see uh, because of my um, border here, the upper left hand side, but let me read this to you. The FBI is seeking the public's assistance in identifying individuals who made unlawful entry into the U S Capitol building and committed various other alleged criminal violations, such as destruction of property, assaulting law enforcement personnel, targeting members of the media for assault, and other unlawful conduct on January 6, 2021. We have deployed our full investigative resources and are working closely with our federal, state, and local partners to aggressively presume, pursue those involved in these criminal activities. And if you have witnessed unlawful violent action or have any information about the cases below, we urge you to contact us. And then they give the FBI number. So remember the day after January 6th, it was January 7th, and um, those homemade videos were starting to disappear online, and you couldn't get access to the same video feeds that you had access to, and Facebook was deleting all the screenshots and the pictures and the posts and things like that. They weren't deleting them. Um, it seems that they were just collecting collecting them, removing them from the internet and collecting them for their own personal usage. And what you're looking at right now is actual YouTube videos from other people who were at the Capitol building um, posting their stuff online. So you'll see the little DHS symbol up in the uh, up in the corner here. And it looks like all of this is from the Federal Bureau of Investigations um, website, which is super funny because I didn't know that the FBI was out there collecting all this footage. I mean, geez, 
They have so much to worry about with white supremacy. I didn't think that they would have the time. But I guess since, you know, 95% of these people are considered white supremacists, then that's this is what they've been wasting their time on is trying to find these people. So um, notes on the filter categories, assault on a federal officer seeking information to assaulted federal Law enforcement personnel assault on the media. So they're seeking in information on individual, individuals who targeted members of the media for assault, threats, destruction of property, or other unlawful conduct. Interesting. So who are they looking for? Let's go ahead and click this, this Department of Justice list of defendants of who they're looking for. Oh, oh, well, that's interesting because it brings us right back to the capital breach cases. So these are all the people that they have collected all this information about, and this is how they found them. So let's go in and read some of these, um, some of these charges. So this is a charge against William Watson. Uh, the violations include ob obstruction of, a vi uh, of an official proceeding, destruction of government property, entering and remaining in a restricted building or grounds with a deadly or dangerous weapon, disorderly and disruptive conduct in a restricted building or grounds with a deadly or dangerous weapon, engaging in physical violence, restricted building grounds, um, and a whole list of other things, including but not limited to parading, demonstrating, or picketing in a Capitol building. And so, of course, um, you'll see here, this is the first count where they're going to explain um, you know, Watson attempted to and did corruptly obstruct, influence, and impede an official proceeding. That is a proceeding uh, before Congress, specifically Congress's certification of the Electoral College vote, is set out in the 12th Amendment of the Constitution. And that's how he got the uh, obstruction of official proceeding and aiding and betting. Uh, count two was for the damaged window. Uh, I guess they assume they prove they've. Uh, intend to prove that he damaged the window, which was a thousand dollars. I would like to see the quote on that. Um, I know that it's a very nice inset window in a, in a gorgeous building, but thousand dollars seems a little steep. What do I know? I'm not, I'm not a glass blower. I have no idea. Um, count three entering and remaining in a restricted building or grounds and, uh, with a, de with a deadly or dangerous weapon. So he, they state that Watson, William Watson did knowingly enter and remain in a restricted building or grounds that is posted, courted off, or otherwise restricted area within the Capitol and its grounds where the vice president and the vice president-elect were temporarily visiting without lawful entry to do so, which did they have lawful entry? Did they not have lawful entry? That's kind of still up in the air. And I'm going to show you a couple pictures that make their case a little murky. And this may be why they pulled all these videos down. Um, but I digress. Let's let's see. What did he have that was considered a uh, deadly and dangerous weapon? That would be the uh, capsaicin spray uh, or pepper spray. And if you go down through this um, affidavit here, It'll give you the rest of, of the charges and it will tell you everything that goes along with the charges. Um, it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. This is just your, your regular um, defendant file, a summary of the charges. But here's the actual complaint uh, written up by the FBI agent who did the investigation on this particular man. You know this man as the Antifa guy who was standing next to the horn guy. I think that's what they actually call him in, in this. Uh, this is the Viking man. They call him the Viking man. So, um, you know, he identified the, the, the guy next to him as the, as the Viking man. And he's claiming that he just kind of went with the flow. That's that's his 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 defense. Uh, he says, quote, no, it was kind of just what the mob was doing. I was I was there helping push on their backs. So, um, you know, will or I'm sorry, Watson stated he had no prior knowledge of the event 
would turn violent and that in hindsight, he would have stayed back from the area where people were charging at in hindsight. This is one of the uh, defendants that they've tried to trot around on social media and on mainstream media as being one of the people who threw Donald Trump under the bus. Oh, Donald Trump brainwashed us. We didn't know that we were going to get in trouble for this and and, and all this stuff. Uh, he and the Viking man, I, I believe it was the Viking man who, who came out and said, you know, I feel so foolish and I would have never done it. And I didn't know da, 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 da. It was just kind of like a big cop out routine. But he said something here that I thought was really interesting. And this is why we're leading with him. He said that, in his opinion, the event turned violent because of law enforcement's, quote, aggressive use of tear gas, pepper balls, and mace. Now, the interesting thing about this is, obviously, you can't really say that you were just going along with what the mob was doing and then turn around and say, well, we got upset because of what law enforcement was doing. Well, were you upset at what law enforcement was doing? Is that why you chose to act? Or were you just part of the mob and you were a follower? See, I would have a lot more respect for you if you if you stuck to your original statement here and said, you know, you turned violent because of the tear gas and the pepper balls and the mace. Because, like I said before, from what I saw while it was happening was more peaceful than violent. There were people who were acting inappropriately. And the funny thing about that is you saw a lot of Trump supporters and a lot of peaceful protesters get into it with those people in an effort to stop the violence before it happened. And we aren't hearing anything about those people We're only hearing about the people who were violent and were taking guns. I think one of the one of the Capitol Police sat in front of Congress and claimed that his gun was stolen from him and he was afraid for his life. And then he got pistol whipped by his own gun. And he was so afraid for his life because people were saying that they were going to kill him. I'm not a rocket science a rocket scientist, but if you can wrestle away a pistol from an officer and your intent is to kill him, why would you beat him with the gun instead of shooting him with his own gun? I don't understand that. So moving on through Watson's complaint, it says in the vi- in the video that they have of Watson, he can be seen holding an item that appears to be a canister and doing something to the top of it in the screenshot below. So again, in a lot of these complaints, you're going to have YouTube screenshots and video screenshots from from people. And so I mean look, look for yourself. Later in the video, Watson can be seen holding up the canister in the direction of law enforcement officers as Watson and the crowd breach another barrier on the U.S. Capitol grounds and move towards the U.S. Capitol building. So I guess this second picture here is supposed to be him pointing this canister at Capitol Police. I mean... It doesn't really look like there's any type of malicious intent here, but albeit far from me to say what his intent was, apparently the FBI knows more than I do, knows more than he does. Watson was interviewed again uh, by your affidavit after waiving his Miranda rights while still in the custody of the state of Alabama on bond revocation in his state criminal case. The interview was recorded. So... Let me just say this, people. You have the right to remain silent in this country for a reason. You don't have to incriminate yourself. You don't have to explain yourself. How it works in a court of law is it is the prosecution's burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you are guilty of a crime. 
anything that you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So when you waive your Miranda rights, there's no taking it back. There's no changing your story. And if you do change your story, come back to bite you. During the interview, Watson admitted to having the can of mace, which, again, from these pictures, can you really determine? We're talking about reasonable doubt here. You just shattered your reasonable doubt, dude. Sorry, you just shattered your reasonable doubt. Your affiant showed Watson the screenshots in paragraph 16 above, which Watson appears to be holding a canister. Upon reviewing the first screenshot, Watson stated that someone had given him the can of mace and he had no idea how to work it. Watson first claimed that the screenshot depicted him asking if others knew how to work the mace and if they wanted it. Later during the interview, Watson admitted he was trying to figure out how to work the canister in case he needed to use it against someone who attacked me. That is going to work against him. It's going to work against him in his case. It's, it's just, it's not going to be good for him. So the conclusion of this affiant, based on the foregoing, your affiant submits that there is probable cause to believe that Watson violated all of these charges that were brought against him. So again, people, just because they have this YouTube video footage, just because they have this, this potentially edited, potentially not edited footage, it could have went either way. They couldn't have said with certainty, without reasonable doubt, that it was one way or another. They had to physically bring this man in and question him on his own volition to get him to admit that there is probable cause to even take him to court. That's not all. This is against Thomas Webster. As you can see, these are also very similar charges to Watson's complaint. Thomas Webster is charged with using a deadly or dangerous weapon that is a metal flagpole. He did forcibly assault, resist, oppose, impede, intimidate, and interfere with an officer, an employee of the United States, of any branch of government, including members of the uniformed services and any person assisting any officer and employee that is uh, from the Metro Police Department, blah, 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 blah. So let's go scroll down to this metal flagpole. Metal flagpole. Okay, these are all his charges. Let's click over here. Let's take a look at the metal flagpole. I know I have pictures of it. All of the affidavits, the statement of facts, all they all start in the same place. Um, where the FBI agent was and who he was sent to um, investigate and his recount of the events at the Capitol. And so the FBI has obtained body-worn camera footage from the Metropolitan Police Department that depicts an assault of an MPD officer that occurred on the Capitol grounds near the bike rack barricade line at the base of the west front of the Capitol building. NR had been dispatched to that location in order to assist U.S. Capitol officers with protecting the Capitol grounds and buildings. Your affiant reviewed the BWC footage depicting the assault as seen in the BWC footage at approximately 2.28 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. An individual wearing a red, black, and white snow jacket, blue jeans, and brown work boots later identified as United States Marine Corps veteran and retired New York City Police Department officer Thomas Webster is seen approaching NR who is barricaded behind a metal gate. Webster enters the screen carrying a large metal flagpole. As he enters, Webster is waving his finger at NR, yelling, you effing piece of shit. You effing commie emmer effers. Man, come on, take your shirt off, take your shirt off. Webster is carrying a large metal flagpole with a U.S. Marine Corps flag attached to it. And there's the picture of him holding his super uber dangerous flagpole after berating 
and R. Webster can be observed aggressively shoving the metal gate into an R's body and then arming himself with the metal flagpole. There's the pictures of him arming himself with the metal flagpole. Webster then raises the flagpole above his head and forcibly swings downward, striking the medical metal barricade directly in front of NR. Okay, there's him. He swung the flagpole. He hit the metal bar. Webster then attempts to attack NR by lunging towards him with the flagpole numerous times. NR is eventually able to wrestle the weapon away from Webster's clutch before NR falls to the ground. NR quickly stands back up, begins retreating further behind the metal barricade. Okay. He was attacked. He got the weapon. Why didn't he arrest him? There you go. There's violence. You have him right there on your body camera. Why wasn't he arrested? Webster proceeds to break through the medical bar the metal barricade and begins charging towards NR with clenched, clenched fists. He lunges at NR and tackles him to the ground. Webster's assault of NR while on the ground approxi lasts approximately 10 seconds. Interesting. Interesting. Your affiant has reviewed on open source media from Twitter that depicts Webster's assault of NR from a different angle. In these open source images, Webster can be seen pinning NR to the ground and straddling him while he forcibly tries to remove NR's face shield and gas mask. Okay, again, I don't understand why you didn't take this man into custody. I don't understand why you retreated after you took his weapon. I don't understand how you are a metropolitan police officer and you allowed this man to just assault you. Your affian has interviewed NR as part of this investigation. During the interview, NR advised that the individual who assaulted him and attempted to rip off his helmet and that he was being choked by his chin strap and was unable to breathe during his portion of the assault. Finally, your affiant has reviewed an open source video posted to YouTube that depicts Webster on the staircase leading to the Upper West Terrace of the Capitol building. Beginning at timestamp 31 seconds of the video, Webster says into the camera, send more patriots, we need some help. Webster also appears to be wearing a dark blue or black body, body armor vest over his torso. We've also heard this a lot. Um, the body armor. I don't get how you can for one second say the body armor is intimidating or a offensive piece of material, uh, uh, an offensive article of clothing, uh, an intimidating article of clothing. I just don't understand that. It's really interesting to me that they did not arrest these people at the time. This person actually had to be turned in. If I, if I don't quote me here, don't quote me here. Yes, this is the one where they... <laughs> Get this, they found out where his kid went to school and they waited for him outside of his children's school and that's how they arrested him. Finally, on February 19th, 2021, your affiant spoke to an administrator at the high school attended by Webster's children. Your affiant then emailed the administrator Bolo 145 images A and C. The administrator positively identified the individual as Webster the administrator confirmed that he or she had seen Webster many times because Webster regularly drops his child off at school. I don't believe that this man has an out for his actions. I'm not condoning his actions, 
But I also cannot wrap my head around the fact that you did not subdue this subject at the time. I cannot wrap my head around Capitol Police retreating. I cannot wrap my head around losing control of this situation the way that they did. And I damn sure cannot wrap my head around the absolute intrusion of every piece of social media available in order to hunt these people down like dogs and bring them to justice when you guys weren't even worried about arresting them at the time. That's what really kills me because if you really cared, come on, where were his backup? Where was the people that they needed? SWAT came in at the end of this and had the entire situation controlled in under five minutes. Flash grenades and barricades, realistically speaking. I mean, they, they, they came in, they flash banged them, the crowd dispersed. SWAT took over the first, uh, the first half of the Capitol building, which was the steps, the inner rotunda, um, all of those things. Then they threw another flash grenade and the crowd dispersed again. So if you were interested in, in bringing these people into custody, why did SWAT come in and disperse all these people? Why didn't SWAT come in and contain these people? Uh, usually whenever they go into like a drug den or they're doing a uh, warrant search, they don't allow the people to escape. I just think that that's really weird. Unless, of course, the idea was to track people down using social media and find out how many people were willing to turn in their neighbors and, um, you know, the, the, the fathers of the children that they teach and so on and so forth. Let's move on to um, another one here. This is, uh, this is Duke Edward Wilson. Duke Edward Wilson. Uh, and he was charged with this breach here. Wilson was in the tunnel and was pushing back on the Capitol Police who were in the tunnels. Um, so according to the video review, the individual later identified as Wilson entered the Lower West Terrace tunnel area of the U.S. Capitol building shortly before 3 p.m. while rioters were pushing against law enforcement officers in an attempt to gain entry into the building. Rioters appeared, appeared to spray liquid irritants towards the officers as they pushed on the officers' shields. Wilson made his way to the front line of the officers. As officers tried to close a set of double doors, Wilson grabbed and tried to pull the door open, then raised what appeared to be a tablet device in order to deflect the spray of an irritant. Okay. Wilson was sprayed with the irritant by officers. Okay. But I thought you said that the rioters were spraying irritants. So was everybody spraying irritants? And how can you be sure who was spraying what? I don't know. I guess we have to really look into these videos. It's a damn shame that we can't because a lot of them aren't available online. So here are some screenshots of the aforementioned activity. There's Wilson. There's Wilson pushing on the shield. There's Wilson pushing on the door. There's Wilson raising the tablet. There's Wilson holding on to a pipe or a pole. And then there's the opposite view in it. Oh, well, there's the pepper spray. But if that's Wilson in the front and he's being pepper sprayed, it's interesting. That's really interesting. Up, oh, raising the pole, tossing the pole. Okay. Okay, tossing the pole. Wilson in the tunnel. Seems to me like he's got pepper spray all over his face. It's interesting. I obtained a driver's license photo of Wilson and compared it to the videos and screenshots above. 
driver's license, hmm, public information. As previously stated, I interviewed several law enforcement officers who interacted with the individual later identified as Wilson while in the tunnel. Uh, prior to and or during my interviews, they reviewed the video clips of the events and I directed them to focus on the individual later identified as Wilson's actions. I did not tell the officers Wilson's identity, rather I told them a physical description of Wilson. Officer one is a sergeant with the U.S. Capitol Police Department. Officer one identified himself in the video and stated that the individual later identified as Wilson punched him, pushed on his head, pushed on his shield, and hit him with a pole in the shoulder. My goodness, these people were so violent. Based on the foregoing, your affiant submits that there is probable cause to believe that Wilson violated 18 U.S.C. 1752A1 and 2, which makes it a crime to, one, knowingly enter or remain in a restricted building or grounds without lawful authority to do so, and two, knowingly and with intent to impede or disrupt the orderly conduct of the government business or official functions, engage in disorderly disruptive conduct in or within such proximity to any restricted or building or grounds when or so that such conduct, in fact, impedes or disrupts the orderly conduct of government business or official functions. Interesting. Super interesting. So here's another case. Again, are these people acting in self-defense? Are these people just going out and, and, and injuring officers. And if that was their main objective, they didn't get very far. They didn't do a whole lot. I'm just saying. Want to charge them with that? It's fine. Let's move on to Shane Woods. Shane Woods has, again, a lot of the same charges as everybody else. Only simple assault and acts of physical violence tacked on his charges. Let's, let's take a look. Shane Woods. Shane Woods, disorderly and disruptive conduct in restricted grounds. Shane Woods did knowingly and with the intent to impede, disrupt the orderly conduct of government business and official functions, engage in disorderly and disruptive conduct in, in and within such proximity to a restricted building grounds that is posted, corded off, and otherwise restricted area within the United States Capitol and its grounds. Okay, so what did he do? Engaging in physical violence in a restricted grounds in violation of Title 18 United States Code Section 1752A. All right, what did he do? Let's look. This is Shane Woods, a.k.a. Shane Castleman. Okie dokie. Let's get down to his pictures here. Because there are pictures here. This is the one that tripped the um, officer, I believe. Okay. So this is a picture of Woods walking in on January 6, 2021 on Constitution Avenue as supporters left the ellipse, and headed to the Capitol building after President Trump's speech. Okay, there's Woods on the steps of the United States Capitol building, and there's Woods again on the steps of the Capitol building. So law enforcement identified a possible match to the uh, above-mentioned person as Shane Castleman. We continued investigation and learned that Shane Castleman uh, is an alias utilized by Shane Woods. They obtained and reviewed a copy of the driver's license for Shane Woods residing in Auburn, Illinois. He compared the driver's license photograph as well as his passport photograph to photographs taken on the U.S. Capitol grounds. And based on his review, he concluded that the individual in the driver's license is Shane Woods and appears substantially similar to the individual identified in figures one through four who was present at the U.S. Capitol grounds on January 6th. 
The FBI located the Facebook account of an individual who publicly identified himself as Shane Woods on or about March 1st, 2021. The account obtained a profile picture and photograph of Woods, which based on a comparison of Woods driver's license and passport photographs were readily recognizable as Woods. There's his Facebook page. There's more pictures from Facebook. According to Facebook records, the account holder for the above Facebook account, the name Shane Woods and verification telephone numbers. Of course, they're blacked out here, but they have his telephone numbers. Uh, is subscribed to Auburn Heating and Air, a company owned and operated by Woods, and is subscribed to Woods Spouse. Both numbers are, bu are billed to Woods residential address in Auburn, Illinois. So not only do they have his phone number, they have his wife's phone number and his business's phone number. According to records obtained through a search warrant, which was served on Google, a mobile device associated with the telephone numbers and the same telephone numbers associated with Wood's Facebook account was present on the grounds of Capitol January 6, 2021, in and around the time of the events described above. Okie dokies. So on January 6, uh, a charge of $12 was made against his account for the purchase of a Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority or Metro card, specifically uh, ERM 060. According to Metro Records, ERM 060 identifies the card was purchased inside the Eastern Market Metro Station in Washington, D.C. According to Google Maps, the Eastern Market Metro Station is approximately a 15-minute walk from the United States Capitol building. So they hacked his bank cards, too. They know he was there. Records obtained from Marriott International shows an individual named Shane Woods' address checked into the Renaissance Hotel in Arlington, Virginia on January 5th, 2021 and checked out on January 7th, 2021. According to records obtained from Priceline, Woods made this res reservation for two nights through Priceline.com. So not only do they have his phone number, his wife's phone number, his business's phone number, his bank account, his passport, his driver's license, they also know his internet history, internet history, guys. So then, of course, you see more pictures from, from Facebook, more pictures from Facebook. Let's get down to his actual charges. Number 29, Woods and Facebook user 5229, wonder who that is, had discussions about the election and events in Washington, D.C. using Facebook messages before January 2021. For example, on December 1st, 2020, Wood sent the following message to Facebook user 5229 about the 2020 elections. Quote, Trump wouldn't be golfing if he was worried. Unquote. Facebook user 5229 replied, quote, true, I hope he has an ace in his pocket. I want to see all those asshats go to jail too, unquote. To this, Woods replied, quote, hung. Oh, oh, I thought we had freedom of speech. It's pretty interesting how these words are now being used against him. And let's be real here. It's just an opinion. Just an opinion. On January 19th, 2021, an associate with the initials TL asked Woods via Facebook, has the FBI come after you yet? Interesting. Interesting. In June 2021, the FBI interviewed two unrelated individuals, witness one and witness two, who reviewed photographs taken of Woods in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, shown below A through D, and identified Woods as the individual who is the subject of this affidavit. Oh, so you went and hunted down those Facebook people, huh? And then well, you did a pretty good job. You did a bang up job. Now, 
That's how we found him. Told you we were going to get to the charges. Okay. On or about approximately 2.10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, January 6, 2021, several USCP police officers attempted to keep a large crowd of protesters who were congregated on the Lower West Terrace in the northwest corner of the Capitol building from approaching the U.S. Capitol. I have reviewed publicly available footage of the activity on the Lower West Front Terrace, here and after referred to as YouTube video number one. In my review of YouTube video number one, I identified one of the U.S. CP officers who was involved in an altercation in that area of the U.S. Capitol grounds at that appro approximate time, who is further identified as USCP Officer A. So based on the review of the YouTube video, corroborated by the information by Officer A, at approximately 2.10 Eastern Standard Time, several officers formed a perimeter around officers attempting to arrest a struggling protester when someone sprayed the officers with their mace. And there you have screenshots from the YouTube video one. Capitol Police officers on the Lower West Terrace of the Capitol building. And there they are attempting to subdue the subject and forming a perimeter and a brown spray can be seen moments later from the left. Okay. A USP, uh, USCP officer A stated that much of her visor was covered with mace and she ran towards the protester who sprayed the mace. Officer A, who confirmed that she is the officer in the video, run in the direction from where the brown spray was sprayed. An individual who appears to be Woods, based on the photographs above and my comparison to his driver's license photograph, as further described, can be, the, can be seen in the same video running towards the U.S. CP Officer A is pursuing the individual who sprayed the mace. As shown in YouTube video one, the officer falls to the ground, loses her helmet, and is surrounded by protesters until she is assisted by another officer. Screenshots from YouTube video one showing Officer A and the assault by Woods are included in figures 11.1 .1 through 11.4 with relevant individuals circled in red. It's pretty interesting here that again, you are attempting to arrest some people, but you're not attempting to arrest other people. And this is such a, a, a terrible incident. This is so horrible, but you can't seem to get the people under control. I'm really confused. I'm just completely confused. Who were you arresting? Why were you arresting some people? Why weren't you arresting other people? And does this not show video of, again, people trying to help the situation, people helping this officer up? Okay, that's what this one shows. Woods assaulting officer. Um, that doesn't look like an assault. To me, that looks like a group of patriots picking her up off the ground. Who am I? I'm just looking at a still shot. I wish I could look at the video. I'd love to, love, love to look at the video. Assault by Woods on member of the news media. On January 6th, a large crowd made its way up to the staging area that was set on the northeast corner of the Capitol. Individuals moved past metal, metal barricades that had been set up around the staging area. Media members were forced to flee the area before recovering all their cameras and associated equipment. Okay. So here is devastation and all the, the, the death to the, to the media cameras. And up, oh, there's Woods in a screenshot standing next to a barricade. Standing next to the barricade, standing next to the piled equipment, standing next to these things. Okay. Okay. Again, these are violent and obviously illegal actions that happened 
and you let these people walk away. And then you hunted them down by going through their social media profiles, by going to their friends, neighbors, and relatives, and getting people to rat them out. You couldn't subdue them on the day, but this is what you, this is what you want to do. Now we're getting down to Joseph's lab. I know this is all sounding really, really redundant. I'm sorry. This is the official counts for Joseph Elliott Slap. Did knowingly and with the intent to impede, disrupt the orderly conduct of government business, uh, entering and remaining in certain rooms of the Capitol building, disorderly conduct, parading and demonstrating and picketing. Okay, let's go take a look. His, here's the statement of facts. This is Zlab entering the Capitol building. Again, this was the footage that was shown on C-SPAN when the Capitol was originally breached. This was the group of patriots who walked into the Capitol building as if they were on a guided tour as opposed to a violent insurrection. And you can see him here. He's in the he's in the uh, rotunda and taking, you know, his time just taking it all in. On January 16th, 2021, FBI received an anonymous tip that Zlab was in the Capitol building on January 6, 2021. The tipster stated that he or she knew Zlab and provided the name of Zlab's place of business. During a subsequent conversation with the tipster, the tipster informed the FBI that his or her parent had informed him or her of Zlab's presence in the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. When shown the photograph, in figure one, the tipster confirmed the image depicted slab. After the tip, your affiant conducted an online search and confirmed the name of Slab's business in Everett, Washington. Slab's business website included a picture of him. After reviewing public records and obtaining a phone number on January 20th, 2021, your affiant called Slab. Zlab identified himself and confirmed he attended the President Trump's speech on January 6, 2020 and participated in the march to the Capitol. Zlab stated he circled the Capitol building two to three times taking pictures. When asked if he went in the Capitol building, Zlab stated he thought he needed an attorney because he did not want to say anything incriminating. Zlab further told the FBI that he flew down to Washington, D.C. on or about January 5th, 2021, returned to Washington on or about January 7th, 2021. Zlab provided to FBI a cell phone number ending in to be used for future contact. Uh, after this conversation, your affiant confirmed with Alaska Airlines that Zlab traveled Seattle to Washington January 5th and returned on January 7th. Uh, they verified the proper number for Zlab through Verizon and Verizon confirmed. And so as we're looking at this dastardly man, um, he noted that he, he took pictures and these are the pictures he posted on Facebook inside the Capitol building. And um, because he was in the Capitol building taking pictures, he is now being charged with all these charges on a federal level. Christopher Whirl. Let's go down to Christopher Whirl here. Okay, this is Christopher Christopher Whirl. He is identified as being a Proud Boy member. That already put him on the hit list from, from day one. He He's already been watched. So as shown... In the next two photographs, Whirl appears to have worn the same or nearly identical tactical vest at the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. In reviewing the images and videos that have been downloaded by the FBI from various open source websites depicting the events of January 6, 2020, as well as the videos submitted from private citizens to the FBI, I found additional images and video that feature an individual whom I believe to be Whirl near and at the Capitol building on January 6th. 
So Whirl identified himself in these photographs from January 6th by his facial features, his salt and pepper hair and shortcut, short haircut, his desert slash tan colored tactical vest and an American flag patch, a Garsden fl flag patch, camera and canister of what appears to be pepper spray. There he is. Uh, this is how they, they identified him on January 6th. Here's his picture um, in or on the Capitol grounds on January 6th. And because he's carrying a can of mace, he's now being charged with um, possession of a deadly weapon. Whirl uh, also has an identifiable scar on the right side of his neck, which I saw when I met with him on January 18th, 2021. While conducting this open source research, I found the following two photographs. The first depicts Whirl with other individuals, several of which law enforcement believe to be Proud Boy members. And the second depicts Whirl near the U.S. Capitol, and Whirl is circled red in both pictures. Okay, he's there. Yeah. I, re I reviewed additional open source video from the YouTube video that shows Whirl wearing the same clothing uh, and in the screenshot from this video, Whirl is wearing what appears to be a push-to-talk radio earpiece in his left ear, which we saw in the prior videos. Now, this is a pretty interesting case. The following two photographs were obtained from a photographer who was provided, who provided his photographs to the FBI. They depict Whirl on the west side of the Capitol building. The area depicted in the following photographs, as well in the photographs, paragraphs 23 through 27, is on the Capitol grounds and is within a restricted building or grounds area. So the first photo is zoomed in, and the second video features that allows him to, you know, features things that allow him to identify him. So these are just more identifying pictures. Now, this is where it gets really interesting here. So they are saying that Whirl has this deadly mace. And this has been a lot of the claims. The claims for deadly weapons you saw were flagpoles and um, metal barricades and things to that effect. Now you're stating that just having mace or pepper spray, which I'm not 100% sure of the laws in Washington, D.C., but most states do not consider that a dangerous or deadly weapon. It's a, a protection method. It's, it's, it's realistically a defense spray. And we even give it to our officers to try to quell or subdue suspects without harming them. And I thought it was really interesting that they have this particular photo here. Let me see if I can blow it up here. Okay. So what you're looking at is an FBI obtained photograph of them depicting where Whirl was in relation to Capitol Police officers. And as you can see, there's a lot of police officers standing around a lot of people who just seem to be peacefully assembling, as is their right. Again, I'm not a rocket scientist. But if these people pushed down these barriers and assaulted police officers in order to get to this point, how come they're all just standing there complacently? Why are these particular officers in the right-hand corner of the screen arbitrarily macing these people? Why are the officers standing on the upper middle side of your screen watching what's happening without doing anything about it, how, how, how does this happen? How does this happen? This, this is crazy because I thought that these were very rowdy. They were all rowdy people. They were unprovoked. They came in with such a negativity that they just wanted to demolish Capitol police. So how is it that the Capitol police aren't being assaulted in this picture? In addition to this individual's clothing, appearance, hair, gaiter, and vest matching that of Whirl, in the other photographs from that day, open source video from Twitter that I have taken appears to confirm that Whirl was present at this location. Okay, yeah, he's there. He's watching these police officers mace these people. 
The photographer also provided the following photograph of Whirl, identifiable by his hair, clothing, hydration pack, tactical vest, and face standing in front of the same statue, which is identifiable by plastic wrapping and the wooden platform just to its right. In this photograph, Whirl appears to be spraying pepper spray gel in the direction off camera near the steps leading to the U.S. Capitol building. The metadata accompanying this image indicates that the photograph was taken at 231. I do not currently know with certainty the target at which Whirl was spraying. However, in other photographs and videos from that time of day, law enforcement officers are positioned where Whirl appears to be spraying pepper spray. You're right. There were officers there. And he is spraying. He was up here. He was up here where, where, where the red, where the red is. And then he moved. And he's over here now where the green is. Okay? So he moved from there to there. What's the timestamp on this particular photo? What's the timestamp here? Was this in response to this arbitrary spraying of mace on peaceful protesters? Or did the police spray in response? And then in which case, how did Whirl get from where the police officers are to all the way back there in order to videotape what was happening? It's interesting. And it really irritates me that they put this particular photo into this particular case without a timestamp. But they have the balls to timestamp this particular photo. Interesting. So if we weren't paying attention, would we be asking these questions? Okay. Here's a more, here's a here's a better picture. And I think that this is an interesting picture because how really how really can you identify who is an officer in this picture and who's not an officer in this picture because it looks to me as if everybody has shifted locations. I mean, we're talking about a developing situation. Officers weren't staying in the same location. And if there was a whole line of officers standing there watching this man, come on, let's count. Let's count together. I count here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 different officers. 15 different officers who are standing around, okay? They're standing around and they're, wa they're watching this happen. They're, they're afraid of mace. They can mace the crowd, but they're afraid of mace being used on them. Guys, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're going to consider pepper spray and mace, to be deadly weapons, deadly weapons, okay? Then you have to say that the police use deadly force against the protesters. And in which case then, who did what first? Who did what first? Were they supposed to just stand there while they were being maced for peacefully protesting? We threw such a hunky fit when... President Trump cleared the streets so that he could get a photo op. You threw a hunky fit. Oh, the pepper spray. Oh, the mace balls. Oh, it's so bad. Okay, but it's, it's not bad when it's used against people who are, in my opinion, again, in the right place at the right time. This parading, this demonstrating, this restricted grounds crap. Bullshit. I'm sorry. Bullshit. So those are some cases, and I highly encourage you to go look and see, and I hope, I really hope that you're just as disgusted as I am, regardless of if there was an actual crime that was committed 
or there was a presumption of a crime that was committed because I do not condone aggressive behavior. I do not condone assaulting people. I do not condone violence, but you have a duty to protect your own safety and well-being. Doesn't matter who it's from. So when somebody is being an aggressor towards you, whether or not they're wearing a uniform, isn't that what the whole BLM movement was about? That, that again, you have people who break the law and are attempting to go into custody, who are getting, you know, killed in the process. They're getting murals. They're getting statues. They're getting accolades. They've got followers. They've got defund the police movements, the police or violent movements, all these things for people who were in the commission of crimes, actual crimes that are detrimental to society, uh, theft from private businesses, um, destruction of private property. We're talking about physical assault on actual citizens, then you have the, the, the officers who, again, they let the people onto the grounds. You don't like it. I'm sorry to tell you. They let people onto the grounds. They let people into the restricted areas. They allowed these demonstrators to take over the Capitol steps. They allowed the violent offenders to escape. They allowed the situation to get out of control. They allowed the violence to escalate. The whole point of having the police involved is not for police to be aggressors, not for police to attempt to subdue people who are standing there voicing their opinions, okay? We took, it, we took a look at some cases where there were some actual crimes being committed. But I said it before and I'll say it again. Being on public capital grounds during a event that affects the entire population of this nation isn't a crime. You'll never convince me that that's a crime. Never convince me. On your screen are the actual arrests made on January 6, 2021. Okay, these were the actual arrests made on January 6, 2021. Unlawful entry all these names, assaulting a police officer, one name, uh, CPWL and unregistered, uh, unregistered ammunition, one name, CPWL, unregistered firearm, unregistered ammunition, one name, assaulting a police officer, one name. So these are the people that were arrested on actual January 6th. Well, I wasn't really convinced because I've seen that big laundry list of charges, right? So let's go on to, they've got over here, this, this weekly arrest summary report, right? Click on that. Oh, okay. So this is the United States Capitol Police Arrest Summary Report. Let's go down to January 6th. Okay. This is 12-31 through January 6th. Hmm can't reach this page. Why can't we reach this page? Okay. Okay. Let's go back to the weekly arrest summary. Maybe I just messed up. Let's try January 7th through the 14th. Hmm. Can't reach that page either. Well, damn, that's pretty interesting. So you mean to tell me literally, literally, that the only people that you arrested on January 6, 2021 are these people right here? That's it? That's the only people? You had all those officers plus SWAT team come in and that's all you got? That's all you got for me? I, I Listen, I don't know how you guys feel about this. I, I, I really don't. And to be honest with you, I don't mind that lawbreakers come to justice. My disgust, my problem with all of this is the methods 
that we are going about doing this. So it's okay for the police to not do their jobs at the time for whatever reason, whether they were incompetent, imp- unprepared, um, lacking in backup, whatever the case may be. It's, it's their job to create orderly conduct. It's their job to arrest law-breaking citizens. It's their job to do these things. So why are we paying them to do this job if they can't do their job? And with all of these things that they're collecting from online social media, all I really want to do is tell you guys to be careful and be aware of what's going on on your social media page, how much information they can actually get from you. Aside from what you believe happened on January 6th, the bottom line is this. Your government is going to become a force to be reckoned with if you don't already believe that they are because of how much information you're allowing them to have and and to keep on you. Um, where your children go to school, what your children look like, where you work, what cell phone provider you have, what city you live in, what township you're, you're, you reside in, where you're, where you received your passport. All of these things are trackable and all of these things are going to be used against you should anything like this occur. And I hear this all the time. Oh, well, I don't have anything to hide. Oh, I don't have to worry about that because, you know, I'm not afraid and I'm not going to commit a crime. I'm not going to break the law. This instance right here has has proven to me that it doesn't matter what you intend to do. It's what they want to prove that you did. Because as you're reading these allegations If these people wouldn't have come forward, if they wouldn't have had um, the tattletales, if they wouldn't have had all this um, metadata to, to, to fall back on, the fact that they did not arrest these people at the time would have made justice for these crimes highly unlikely. The only reason that they were able to hunt these people down was through their social media and, and through tipsters and informants Um, in the communities. This is a big thing because not only are we having it for the January 6th incidents, they're counting on you to do this for COVID too. And I brought it to your attention that, you know, the DHS has come out and, and labeled anybody that goes against coronavirus restrictions as being domestic terrorists I really feel that that's huge in setting the scene for for these people walking back into court in September. Are they going to ramp up these these benign charges? I mean, now granted, they're federal charges nonetheless, but to make an example out of all these people, are they going to use that DHS memo to then classify these people as homegrown domestic terrorists And is it going to put enough fear into the hearts of Americans so that they never step out of line again? Are you going to be too afraid to stand and redress your grievances with your government because the FBI can go hunt down your Facebook page? They can obtain information and pictures of you uh, taken by other people and by people in your community and put you on trial uh, based on accusations of others. I mean, this is this is mob rule on steroids, and it's scary. It took me probably three or four days to digest all this information and actually calm down enough to explain it to you folks. Um, All I want to do is bring attention to it. Again, I know this was another long video and I apologize for that. I don't set out to do an hour long video. It just turns out that way when you have so much information to go through. And it's hard for everybody to go through this information. I get it. You don't have the time. 
Thankfully, I do. So I try to get it as concise as possible and regurgitate it back to you. But again, that is no substitution for doing your own research and coming to your own conclusion. Now, you don't have to agree with my mindset on the the charges, but please, please take into consideration the way that they're going about hunting these people. And I do believe that this is, this is a manhunt and, um, it was a test, uh, of things to come. I think that this was, you know, just like the coronavirus experiment and the vaccine. I think that this was a test to see how much information and how much accurate information they could actually get and obtain from multiple sources. And how is it going to play out in court? Is a jury, is a judge going to accept this as um, irrefutable proof or proof beyond the shadow of a doubt. I guess we'll have to wait until September, October, um, you know, the end of this month to see if that's what's going to happen. But that's all I have for you guys today. Again, sorry for the long video. Um, Please, please, please go and watch the non-compliant movie that I posted from Chrisanne Hall. Um, go back to her website and leave a review for that as well. If you liked it, give it a big thumbs up, share it, please. And uh, that's all I have for you guys. And I will catch you on the next one.